Marcus Ely here for Status Quo, and I'm here with David Harris Jr. Um, and you just left the White House and then came right here to um, Trump stock to uh, headline the event, in fact. Um, now, the one thing that uh, you kind of pointed out when you were speaking up there was uh, about folks being surprised that there are black Trump supporters. Um, Surprise. Yeah, so, um, can you talk a little bit? Um, about what you, uh, why you support the president as a black person? Yeah, a absolutely. You know, I, I vote my values. And my mom taught me, uh, you want to hold that or me too? My mom taught me growing up um, to pay attention to how people vote and not just listen to what they say. And so I didn't really get it too political until Barack Obama got on the scene. And I began to look at how he voted and the things that he would support. And the hugest, the biggest issue for me has always been as a person of faith first. I'm a Christian first, uh, and then I'm an American, and then I'm a member, I'm a member of the black community. Uh, I, I cherish, cherish the fact that I'm a citizen of this country and that I was born here. But my, my most valued um, aspect of my being and existence is my faith in God. And as a believer, I believe in pro-life. I don't believe that anybody should have a choice to murder especially murdering our most innocent babies. And so with Barack Obama, uh, he was very pro-abortion. He was pro a uh, late-term abortion and partial birth abortion. He even voted to block bills that would have given aid to babies that had survived botched abortions. So I did not vote for Barack. Uh, I shared it in my, book, in my book, why I couldn't stay silent, that I actually cried when he won because it hit me once he won that a black man had just become president. But then that was overshadowed with, with fear and sorrow of what I felt like he was going to try to do for, to our country. And I believe he did push some, some things down the road that were not good for the black community, weren't good for America as a whole. But um, so that's when I really began to get political. And then after the third debate between Trump and Hillary, I saw the same stuff in, in Hillary Clinton as I was seeing and hearing from Barack Obama, that she was very pro-choice, that babies didn't have any rights if they were inside the womb, even up to nine months of pregnancy, which is just asinine for me to think about, for anybody should, should, to think about a baby being fully formed at seven, eight, nine months, and the mother being able to say, I want to terminate this, this baby. It's just ridiculous. So Hillary was very pro-choice. Donald Trump was very pro-life. And for me, that's what stood out the most. And so that's when I really began, began to start to become vocal uh, in my support for life, which was supporting Donald Trump. Um, so abortion and that was that was your main selling point in being Republican and supporting Trump and whatnot. To me, that's the crux of it. Yeah, because it's a part of the Democrat platform is pro-choice, which let's call it what it is. It's choice to murder babies. You know, now we have the science that shows a baby has a heartbeat at eight weeks and can feel pain at 10 weeks. So who in their right mind would want to do any kind of harm to a baby that has a heartbeat and that feel that feels pain. You know, if there's an accident that takes place, one of the first things that, you know, any EMT that shows up on the scene will do for a person that maybe is unconscious is they check for a pulse. If there's a pulse, it's a sign of a life. And then they do everything they can to try to help that individual and resuscitate and, and nurse that person back to health. Well, these babies have pulses. They have heartbeats. They have life. So if that is fundamentally wrong with the Democrat Party's platform and it's a part of their platform, I don't see what I don't see how much else could be right enough that would give me any reason to vote for them. So I've never been able to vote Democrat, period. Okay. Um, so I wanted to know how you felt about Ilhan Omar because you were speaking about her up there. Um, and one of the things you said was that she called America the the um, villains. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to splice in the clip from Samantha B, and then um, we'll come right back. You know, we're very comfortable in being the hero in every story. Mm -hmm. We are not comfortable anytime somebody reminds us we have been a villain. And it is my job to make sure that we can end this story um, as a hero. Why did you frame it that way that she said America was the villain when what was said in the clip was that America... Uh, America has trouble hearing. Americans have trouble hearing that we were the villain in certain situations. Well, I think her rhetoric is her her uh, rhetoric has been the same 
It's not just even that one instance. There's been a lot of things that she said. I, I shared videos on my page where she talked about Al Qaeda with like, you know, like it was a positive, and she talked about our military like it was a, a negative. When did she talk about Al Qaeda like it was a positive? Your research. I, I posted the videos on my page, David J. Harris Jr. No, I, I understand. I'm just I'm asking because like, there's I, I I've seen her full um, videos and whatnot, and the one thing I've seen her do is I've seen the speech that the president shared um, multiple times. The one where they said some people did so, where she said some people did something. That was another instance. That was another instance. Yeah, that wasn't even the one I'm talking about. Well, that that was an edited speech, though. That wasn't what. That wasn't the whole concept. What she was saying was some people did something, and you tried to blame some people. Uh, tried to blame the whole Islam for something some people did, and that's what she was saying. And that y'all mischaracterized that. Like, I, I just I I I, I, don't, I don't I don't I don't want to. I really I, I'm not the type of person to fight and whatnot, but just, I don't know, our debate, like debating isn't my thing. Conversation, but if we're going to have a conversation, it's got to be a two-way street. Yes, sir. And for any, for any American that has felt the weight of 9-11 uh, and understand that weight and what America went through during 9-11, to hear anybody then speak about that instance in time that ripped America, America's heart open, and have it frivolous, frivolously just thrown out as some people did something. I don't think that's a mischaracterization at all. She didn't say some. She didn't say some people did something. She's saying exactly she, she said some people did something, and you blamed everybody in Islam for it. That is the definition of a mischaracterization, you're, especially you're against a interpretation of it. That's that's you and trying to interpret it and minimize. That's that's, what she's that's language. That's you trying to interpret and minimize what she's saying, but it backs up everything else that she said. She's very anti-Semitic. Uh, she said a lot of anti-Semitic statements. She said, she said it's all about the Benjamins, baby, when she was talking about money and politics in regards to APAC. It's a nonstop, it's, it's a nonstop rhetoric. For, for somebody to try to characterize something that was one of the most horrific things that Americans have ever gone through in our country and just pass it off as some people did something, I don't think you, you can try to minimize that. And that's what you're trying to do. Some people did something very horrible. It was very horrible what they did, but some people did it. 19 people. There were 19 hijackers. There's 1.3 or 1.6 billion people in Islam. So I'm, I'm personally an atheist okay. or agnostic. Okay. But at the same time, as somebody who, who just doesn't like to see anybody treated a certain kind of way just because of what they believe, just like you feel like with your family, how they feel like you support Trump and you got family members that don't talk to you no more. Right. So that's the, there are folks that because they believe this and it's been handed down to them for generations. We're going to blame all of them because 19 people did something. I, I don't think that's the, the right approach either. But there also needs to be an awareness that there are there are radical jihadis that are a part of a certain faith that do want to do damage and harm to this country. And basically anywhere that they go, it's it's a part of their belief system. And if you take, say, one point three billion, you said. And let's say that the statistics are what I've heard, 15 to 20 percent of them are radical. Then you've got how, how many millions is that? You've got 1.3 million, three, th uh, 30 million people, basically, that are radical. If 20 percent of 1.3 billion are where, radical, where are those numbers coming from? Do your research. You're the one making the assertion, though. What I'm telling you is you've got your own show. Do your research. If you should really want to know, especially if you're an agnostic. But I'm not making the assertion. That's what I'm saying. You're making the assertion. The burden of proof is not on me. The burden of proof is on you. Well, I've done my research. And that's what Then if you've done the research, then state your, then state your proof. Sure. Uh, uh, Gabrielle, what's her name? You know what I'm talking about? No, I didn't. I didn't make the assertion. Yeah. If anybody uses Google and finds it, they don't take my word for it. Right? Here's a perfect example. People hear news all the time. Instead of taking a person's word for it, go look it up. I would encourage people to look up and say, what are the statistics of radicals, jihadi Muslims that are part of the Muslim faith? And then if you find that number and it says it's 15 to 20 percent, that's a lot of people that have a belief system that wants to completely eradicate everything that is America. And that should be alarming to anybody. <sighs> so I don't, I don't, I look, I, I, I don't, I don't want to be. I really don't want to be this guy right now. I really don't, but but my mama would kick my butt if I don't. Um, Ilhan Omar is an immigrant, a Muslim, a refugee, a black 
woman in America. She got five strikes against her from jump. She got death threats the second. It's not the victim card. It's I'm I I I, she's in Congress. She and she's in Congress. So with all those strikes against her, yes, she still made it to Congress. How are those all strikes against her? And 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 you call her a black woman, right? Mm -hmm. Is is now black just a color for anybody that's got skin tone in in America? People still people still. You do realize Somali is in Africa, right? Yeah, I understand that, but. If she's a Somali refugee, she's actually Somalian. But that's Somali is in Africa. That makes her black. Well, uh, what I'm saying is, it, for a person to have all these strikes against them, yet to make it to Congress, why did you start out your your statement like that? Well, I'm just, she's I obviously. Was, I know you you cut me off. I didn't get to finish my statement. Okay. Um, my my thing was, it's just she got all those strikes against her in America, and, and let's just. And yes, she still made it to Congress, but she got all this stuff against her. You you do realize that it's all this. It's it's not a victim mentality though. There's a difference between a victim mentality and being victimized because of your identity. America is identity politics. It has been since its since its inception when it cut black people into three fifths of a body. It it's been that way. You know what I mean? Like from jump, white male landowners. It's, it's been. I think it's a mindset. It doesn't. Slavery was a choice. Well, no, I don't. I don't, I don't agree with that. Slavery was a choice. I mean, it wasn't a choice for the people that were, were stuck in it. But the, the current mental state of people right now to choose to have a victimhood mentality, which says I have all these strikes against me, therefore I have to. Uh, uh, you have to work hard. Period for whatever you want. But I don't believe that racism is a reason to keep anybody from being able to achieve anything right now in in, in, in America, especially. And it's, and she's in she's in Congress. It's, she succeeded and got in Congress. Okay, she succeeded and got in Congress because of Justice Democrats. The Justice Democrats are a group of people. Are a group. Yeah, the Justice Democrats backed people to run against the establishment Democrats. And then on top of that, the establishment and Nancy Pelosi didn't even defend her versus when APAC attacked her. Didn't even defend her right when Trump came out against her first. Like, she doesn't have extra stuff against her? Bruh, come on. What's your point trying to be that she's got all these things against her? I, I don't my think... My point is there are things... That is my point. There are all these extra things. She, there are, These systems of oppression are real. They are documented throughout... Multi, you talk about do your research. What have those systems kept you from being able to accomplish in your life? What have those systems kept me from... Oh, I'm so glad that you asked me. Yeah. I, um, I actually happen to have three children. Okay. I have three children. And I'm a married man. Um, and it's <laughs> Mr. President. <laughs> um, all right. All right. God bless you. Air Force One. Yeah, Air Force One is calling your name. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, brother. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember where we were. I completely ADHD'd out of it. You asked, okay, my personal experience. What kept me from accomplishing things? I am 33 years old, 34 years old, married man. And I'm currently a stay-at-home dad. I have three kids. Because I have three kids and we don't have the certain systems that allow us to do things, I can't get a job right now. What I have to make $35,000 a year. Systems? The systems that, that, that where I put in my application and I get half as many callbacks as somebody with the exact same resume with a less black-sounding name. And my name is Marcus, spelled M-A-R-Q-U-I-S. It looks like Marquise. That is the most black-sounding name there is. Like, you look at it. So you're saying your inability to get a job has to do with your name? There's documented studies to prove that. That's a that's an academic study. So you're blaming the fact that you chose to have three kids and now you can't get a job on your name. No, that's not what I'm blaming it on. What I'm say what I said was because I have to get a job that pays thirty five thousand dollars a year. That makes it harder. But again, you you just you did you did that trick. You almost got me. I'm not going to move and make it about me. I was defending Ilhan Omar, not myself. I moved to that, so I moved from that, and I allowed you to move from that. But Ilhan Omar was who I was defending, and I'd like to stay on defending her. And she made it in Congress. She's a successful woman in America that's made it to Congress, but you're trying to propose to me that there's certain systems in place that keep people from succeeding. So that's why I asked for, for an example. Because to me... Well, you know, she, it's I, uh, 2019, and she's the first Muslim woman to ever be in Congress in a country that claims to be secular. Well, In, in its constitution. Well, the first black congressmen were in the 1860s uh, and 70s. They were all Republicans. The Democrats didn't have a black... That was before the Southern strategy. 
Well, yeah, and that's all that's all backwards too, in, in all of that. But uh, all this would be great to debate. If you want to actually have a debate and come on my show, we could do that. Okay, yeah, I, I that would actually that would be awesome.